Our webinar series is called We Are All Part of One Another. This is a line from the feminist nonviolent activist Barbara Deming. That line, we are all part of one another, is of course reflective of an ancient truth that lies at the heart of all world religions and the scientific understanding of humans as intensely social and interdependent creatures. The purpose of this webinar is to explore the utility and experience of nonviolent resistance to defending democracy in elections. We want to th thank our co sponsors, Beautiful Trouble which exists to make nonviolent revolution irresistible by providing an ever-growing suite of strategic tools and trainings that inspire movements for a more just, healthy, and equitable world. We also want to thank our co-sponsors, Blackout Collective and OR Books, which have promoted this event today. Now let me introduce our webinar host, Maria Stefan. Her career has bridged the academic policy and nonprofit sectors with a focus on the role of civil resistance and nonviolent movements in advancing human rights, democracy, and sustainable peace. She is the co-author of Why Civil Resistance Works, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict. In addition to hosting, we hope she will contribute her renowned knowledge to today's topic of defending democracy in elections. For a more complete introduction, please refer to the chat window where we will also be posting the full bios of our other panelists. Maria, thank you and welcome. Great, well, Michael, thank you so much for that kind introduction and huge thank you to Nonviolence International, Beautiful Trouble, Blackout Collective and OR Books for joining forces um, on today's event, which uh, I don't think could be more timely. Um, and I wanna welcome you all joining from the United States and from around the world for today's webinar on democracy defense, advice from activists around the world. Um, I would encourage everyone first and foremost to join for the full two hours uh, because of the importance of this topic and because of the rich panel and global experiences that need to be shared. Uh, this webinar is recorded and will be shared on the Nonviolence International YouTube channel. So just a brief overview of the agenda for this morning or this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are. Um, we'll first hear from our great group of panelists who will be speaking about seven minutes each. Um, that will be followed by an intra-panel discussion which will then be followed by question and answer with you all and then uh, final announcements and closing. And I would just note in framing that we are holding this conversation today less than one month away from a highly consequential election in the United States and in the wake of nationwide Black Lives Matter protests, which were the broadest and the most persistent protests in US history. The US president has cast doubt on the election process and refused to accept a peaceful transition of power. We know that his behavior resembles that of many autocratic leaders around the world. We also know that there are proven ways to challenge such behavior, prevent executive power grabs and protect democracy. Our esteemed group of panelists today will share stories from their personal experiences that shed light on strategies and tactics that have been used effectively in other countries in order that we might learn from their experiences here in the US. So let me now introduce our panelists. Um, each will speak for about seven minutes in the order that I introduce them. After they all speak, there will be time for active participation and conversation with them and amongst all of us here on the webinar. So let me start with Filipino professor and activist Joaquin Gonzalez. Dr. Gonzalez is a professor of public administration at Golden Gate University in California. He was a street activist in the 1986 People Power Revolution that peacefully removed a longtime authoritarian from power in the Philippines. Next, Serbian nonviolent organizer and activist Ivan Maravich. Ivan is an organizer, software developer, and social innovator from Belgrade, Serbia. He was a student organizer and one of the leaders of Otpor, a resistance movement which played a critical role in the downfall of Slobodan Milosevic in 2000. He will be followed by Gambian organizer and activist Mohamed Lamin, Lamin Saidi Khan. 
Lamin was the Pan-African Advocate of the Year in 2018 and was named one of the one of 100 most influential young people leaders in Africa in 2019. As a human rights activist, he organized widespread protests to get long ruling Gambian dictator Yaya Jame to step down. He will be followed by Joanna Veron. Joanna is the executive directress and creative chaos catalyst at Coding Rights, a women run organization working to expose and redress the power imbalances built into technology and its application, particularly those that reinforce gender and north-south inequalities. And last but not least, we'll be hearing from American political, American professor and author Stephen Zunas. Uh, Dr. Zunas is a professor of politics and international studies at the University of San Francisco, where he served as founding director of the program on Middle East studies. He's one of the foremost scholars of nonviolent civil resistance and has published groundbreaking research on popular resistance to coups. So without further ado, I will now pass the mic to Dr. Gonzalez to kick us all off. Dr. Gonzalez, over to you. Thank you, Maria. Good morning, everybody. Everybody okay? Morning. Morning. Uh, can I get the screen share, please, host? Thank you. Uh, it's still disabled. Uh, can the host please enable screen share? You should be co-host now. Can you try? All right. Thank you. Uh, there you go. You're, so you're streaming my, my screen right now, and I'm, uh, I have seven minutes, so I'm going to uh, go through this. You know, I want to thank you, everybody. I, I, you know, I love this being in a room with fellow activists. Uh, you know, I, I've been more subdued now. Uh, being an activist in San Francisco, I miss the days that I'm on the streets in Manila and chasing after dictators and facing, you know, security forces. Of course, barbed wire, uh, the regular barbed wire that's given us. But uh, you know, so I'd like to share with you some of my experience. Uh, on the field, maybe three things, uh, lessons learned from uh, being a, a, an activist then and being a, an activist here in San Francisco, uh, you know, these days. All right, so uh, I, I'm gonna talk about fighting violence with nonviolence. Uh, don't just pray, act, and uh, people power, you know, the people, you know, people power can't stop. So these are three topics. And uh, what I'll do is I'll really talk through some images that I have. So when I was growing up in the in the Philippines, uh, uh, you know, when uh, I oh, there was only one president that I saw. This president came into power in '65. I was born in '64, and by the time I was in college, he was still in power. Uh, so you know, uh, growing up, we just said, you know, let's not just uh, do anything with politics. Let's just follow the flow. My parents did the same thing. He said. Uh, when martial law was declared, um, we said, okay, we're just going to follow this, uh, this person. He was a very charismatic person. And, uh, you know, my parents voted for him in 65. Uh, you know, he was, he was uh, really a, uh, he had all the potentials as a, 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 as a leader. But then in, se in, in 72, he, decide he decided that he was going to declare martial law. His term was supposed to be up in 1973. Uh, the Philippines follows a two four year term, so 65 to 69, 69 to 73. But he decided to change that and he decided to stay in power uh, more. He, of course, put in jail all of his uh, political opponents. He cracked down on us uh, student activists. He closed down, uh, you know, student publications. He, he cracked down on, on, on the press. So, uh, I decided, uh, you know, to follow my parents' advice and just become, a, you know, a, a uh, you know, a bio and marketing major. They said, go to the pharmaceutical industry, make money, and just, uh, you know, uh, make a life. Help us. Uh, you know, you still have six brothers and six sisters. You know, you're gonna help us. But I couldn't help that, you know, the family was declining at that time. We didn't. We started out with running water. By the middle of martial law, we didn't have any, more, you know, water inflowing into the house. So everything was declining around me, and I saw street protests moving towards the palace, watching them from the, you know, from my school, and I decided, you know, got to do uh, something about this. 
uh, you know, you when you are facing truncheons, when you are facing uh, firemen with uh, fire hoses, it's really hard not to be violent when the situation you are in is very violent. So I really take my hats off to those of you. Uh, you know, I have friends, uh, you know, fellow activists who have been raped. I have fellow activists where, you know, Russian roulette was played uh, by soldiers on their head. Uh, I have, uh, you know, fellow activists who've been hit by truncheons. I have been, you know, you know forced into barbed wire uh, myself during my activism. So fighting violence with, uh, with, with nonviolence is really, really very challenging for everybody because it's a very emotional situation and people are, you know, falling outside. There's a, you know, there's a Molotov cocktail that just right beside you and here are soldiers and they're firing at you. What are you gonna do? There's a tear gas that's just rolled over you, thrown by a soldier. Uh, you know, what are you gonna do, right? Are you gonna throw it back? So fighting violence with violence really is, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's really there and it's drawn by emotion, it's very hard. Uh, don't just spray an act. The one that calmed us down during the people power revolution are uh, you know, priests and nuns and the spiritual, they have a very meditative effect on the people and they had a meditative effect and calming effect on the soldiers. Uh, you know, a lot of the soldiers, they were ready to shoot to kill. The order from the palace was shoot to kill every one of us. Uh, there's an effigy there of Marcos and Reagan. He was backed by Mr. Reagan. All of these security forces was trained by the U.S. military, Fort Bragg, Fort, you know, and, 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 and their position was to shoot us and kill us. And, you know, we just surrounded the tanks. We just held on to them. The religious people were right up there, up front and center. They said, we're not just going to pray. We're going to be up there doing action, prayer to action. We're going to face them. We're going to pr we pray with them. We're not armed. We're going to do something. Uh, you know, about it. So it's just, you know, we saw them. It's like, don't just pray. We need to act. So we left our churches. We left our mosque. We, you know, we went there on the streets. Uh, this, so we said, so, you know, what are we going to do? The only way we can remove them peacefully is really to protect the ballot boxes and really to get somebody elected. We had one person who was the complete opposite of Mr. Marcos, and that's Mrs. Aquino who we wanted to win, but we had to ensure that this person who uses guns, goons, and gold would be, uh, you know, prevented from doing that. So we decided to form NAMPREL. NAMPREL is a national move, citizens movement for free elections. And we decided that we're going to secure the ballot boxes. Whatever they do, whatever these security forces, if they're gonna steal it, we're going to be in front of those boxes. We're gonna hold hands, Capit Pisig is our call, and we're going to protect uh, these, ballot, these ballot boxes. We're going to make sure that the, that the count, we're not going to make sure that these ballot boxes are not stolen, they're not stuffed. And that's what, uh, that's what we did really. Uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, activists were with us on the streets and we were protecting these ballot box, boxes, making sure that the count was calm, accurate, and uh, was there. Got a minute left, Joaquin. Thank you. Lastly, is my people power can't stop. After ousting, after ousting uh, Mr. Marcos, oops, after ousting Mr. Marcos, we found out that, uh, you know, we just, we, we really replaced somebody who is from the upper class in the Philippines with somebody who's from the same class. Mrs. Aquino comes from that same political class, which means one lesson we learned that activists on the ground is that the people power we showed, the restraint we showed, the tolerance we showed cannot stop. It cannot stop. People power is an ongoing, is a continuing revolution. And whenever there is a threat similar to Mr. Marcos, we must come back to the streets and we must protect the ballot boxes again. So NAMFREL, the National Movement of uh, Free Election lives on. We continue to protect the ballot boxes. Because in the Philippines right now are in, entrenched political dynasties who have the same intention as Mr. Marcos, 
to remain in power for decades. Those are my three thoughts, my three images uh, for you. And I'd like to pass it back on to Maria. Back to you, Maria. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez, for those um, very um, inspiring remarks on um, just the, the, the power, people power of remaining nonviolent in the face of violence, uh, moving from prayer to action, uh, the role of religious leaders in maintaining kind of calm and discipline. And of course, people power has to continue um, after the election. So thank you. We now turn the mic over to Ivan Marovich. Ivan, over to you. Hey, thank you very much. And uh, I don't have a PowerPoint, so maybe we can turn this one off. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint because, you know, as they say, all power corrupts, but PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. So I, I will tell you a story. I don't have a kind of, I don't want to tell you the whole story because we obviously don't have time for that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to share here with you in the chat uh the uh like uh my blog where you can find the details so i wrote this one some years ago so you will see the whole the whole story of odpor but what i want to talk about now is a couple of things that i think are really relevant today first one is that we shouldn't think that uh, like it is portrayed often in the movies or in the books, that dictatorship is some order, uh, discipline, strict uh, hierarchy and militarism, all this stuff. Dictatorship is often associated with chaos and dictators are agents of chaos. And definitely Milosevic back in the day, as I was growing up, was an agent of chaos. He was such a uh, good agent of chaos or such a successful agent of chaos that he actually ended up destroying our country, the country I was born in, Yugoslavia, which collapsed into a civil war, actually four consecutive wars that uh, dragged on over the 90s, poverty, we were placed under the international blockade by the United Nations, uh, there was like hyperinflation like we never seen before in, in, in history, poverty, as I said, uh, and uh, a lot of people left the country as refugees. I was one of those who was contemplating. And then what happened is a protest started. There was like uh, manipulation of the elections at the local level. And uh, so I got dragged into the student protest, which lasted for four months, had a great time, like we were marching during the day, uh, partying during the night. We were like really kind of uh, uh, very, very enthusiastic about it. But eventually after four months, uh, the energy died down and this turned out to be a failure, although we made some small gains on the local level, as I said. So our kind of development was building from protest to a movement and trying to think beyond street protest. How can we challenge the dictatorship uh, uh, beyond the uh, street demonstrations and, and, and these kind of manifestations? So another thing which was important and, uh, and similar to what was happening in the Philippines, what Joaquin was already describing, was the manipulation of the election process. Not just stealing of the elections, but the manipulation of the whole process like, uh, you know, the, the registration of political parties, how they're being financed, how they're being, so like running a lot of fake candidates just to disrupt the, 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 the process. We had like hundreds of political parties that would be registered uh, and, and, you know, just to kind of make it more, more difficult for opposition to, to, to operate. But in the end, it came down to the stealing of the elections. If you cannot, uh, manipulate things differently and people still vote uh, for, for the opposition candidate, which in our case was this boring uh, professor of law, uh, kind of conservative, uh, not very inspiring, but he was the candidate again, against Milosevic in, in 2000. So what we needed to have to make sure that the elections are not stolen is several things. First one is 30,000 observers at the polling stations, which are going to document the fraud in uh, real time as it is happening. Second thing, we had to have 
population that is excited about voting and excited about, excited about defending their vote. So they should be determined to uh, go out and defend their vote once the, once the manipulation is, is, uh, of the vote is happening. And the third thing, we had to have a very clear guidelines on what kind of uh, activities needed to, to protect the vote. So similar to what Joaquin was saying, you know, we needed to move away from violence. In our case, we were in the civil war. Uh, people who were now playing the role of the police and especially the special police were the same people who were responsible for war crimes in Bosnia and Kosovo. So we were, the last thing we wanted was to kind of play that game with them because we knew that these guys were capable of uh, like severe brutality. So that's why moving away from street protests towards non-cooperation was key. So that was the third part. The first one, documenting the vote, uh, voter fraud. Second one, getting people excited about defending their vote. And the third, giving them the clear guidelines on how to do it. Non-cooperation, first in their neighborhoods, in their towns. And this was building up after the elections for 10 days. They would block the local roads. They would uh, uh, organize protests in their neighborhoods and in their uh, communities, not in the central uh, point, but rather dispersed around. And they would organize strikes and blockades in, in the places of work, where there was a kind of workplace action, and especially started with the, with the students and then people in the retirement homes and then uh, taxi drivers, uh, public transportation drivers, and then Finally, it, at the end, it was the miners in the coal mines which were supplying coal to the electricity production, which kind of threatened to put the whole country in, in darkness. So that uh, non-cooperation was crucial to actually uh, fight back against, uh, uh, against the, the dictatorship and, the, and, and Milosevic's attempt to steal the elections. Because although he could uh, confront us in the street, and he did, uh, it was a problem for him to confront people when they were like stopping work and, and, uh, and actually uh, fighting him back with, uh, uh, with the general strike, essentially. So in an that. essence, yes, so I'm, I'm, I'm about to. So in an essence, our, our biggest maybe uh, success was in the uh, in those three principles that we that we actually managed to come up with over a longer period of time and probably 10 years of trial and error uh, but essentially that was the reason why his attempts to manipulate the elections uh, to steal the votes and finally to crush the protest didn't succeed in the end Great. Well, thank you very much, Yvonne, for highlighting those uh, three kind of key ingredients of documenting the fraud and irregularities, getting people excited about voting and getting out to vote, and then moving from protest to mass non-cooperation. Um, great. So now moving on to uh, Lamin Saide Khan. Lamin, we turn the mic over to you. Thank you. Good to be here. Greetings to everybody. Um, yeah, I, I also don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but I believe that um, um, our stories will connect the hearts and minds of all of us who are listening here today. Um, yeah, I actually happen to grow up in a country that had been ruled by a dictator. One of, I call him the world's most brutal dictator um, who ruled the Gambia for 22 years, Yaya Jame. Uh, when I was in primary four, he took over the country I hear what they call the word democracy when I was growing up, but I don't understand. I could not see the essence and then um, I could not see it. I could not feel it. So as I grew up, I, 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 I saw that a lot of people go missing. People are killed. People are butchered. Their flesh are given to crocodiles. Uh, if, you, if you cough, you are arrested. If you talk about him, you are arrested. You are taken to bars, behind bars. You know, just, so there's a whole increase of fear as the country goes through um, uh, dictatorship. So Gambians gradually fled the country, those who can flee the country, um, those who can hide behind um, any kind of corridor, they're hiding in terms of advocacy. So kind of kill down all the different um, civic space completely, it's almost dead. There is no room for organizing. NGOs 
are threatened when they even talk about rights for women or rights for land and things like that. Um, so from the within that process, we I, I I used to be a student organizer. Then I was given a task to organize an activist group um, after attending some international trainings and national trainings on organizing. And from that process, <clears throat> I started building you know uh, a movement in Gambia. Uh, where we, we call it Activista, which is uh, an activist network that um, uh, builds the capacity of a lot of young people um, from, to become trainers, to understand how to really uh, organize and do advocacy programs from the below. That means touching the powers that are below, you know, engaging councillors, engaging uh, municipalities, engaging regional governments and parliamentarians. We don't touch the, the bigger power. Uh, to be very careful not to be cracked down easily, immediately. So from that process, we use the powers that the president says that they have the support from, that is women and young people. So we try to engage them, try to you know, build that capacity to understand the realities of issues. So creating the, um, the, the possibility of an anger between the citizens. Uh, one of the key things that work for us in our, in our struggle is creating an anger within the citizenry, making people to be aware you know, that we have to end this dictatorship now. We have to really have our freedom. We have to enjoy the democracy that Gambia have been enjoying. Gambia actually was named the most democratic country uh, in, 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 in May 1994 and becomes the worst democratic country in Africa in, in July 24, 1994. So you can see this, this small gap uh, that, that is between, uh, between where we become best and now where we become uh, the worst. So we, we started creating that anger of, uh, of the citizens. And then people started testing waters. People started testing waters by demanding for a transfer because the president at some point felt that he was the king, he was the ruler, he could do anything that he wants and want to attack even those who vote against him. Um, so when he did that, he changed the election laws by asking a lot of money from, um, from the opposition leaders uh, who will ever will contest with him, but also saying that you know, there'll be an on the spot vote counting introduced. So when those things are in, um, introduced, you know, activists, uh, started testing waters by doing an open protest for the first time. Uh, some, of, some of the activists got arrested, others were beaten to death. Uh, that created a, more, a momentum of, you know, uh, of, of, of a revolution. We call it the Kalama Revolution, where women will be going to the courthouse you know, with a local spoon, saying that Middle City is about change. You have to drink and pass the, the baton to another person to drink. You cannot own the country. You cannot be the only one uh, ruling. Then we, as we do those processes, people uh, gain, gain more momentum and more courage, and they started uh, um, organizing what they call the Broom Revolution, where we started sweeping the streets of, uh, of the city, saying that it's time for the president to go. We really need to uh, have him go. So um, a lot of people got arrested again. Some people are going to jail. They could not witness, witness the election. So, but our advantage was to use the, the laws that he have introduced, that we on the spot counting at our advantage, by ensuring that we do a massive um, voter sensitization and ensure that people understand that election is the solution. So very similar to the, um, the previous speaker's stories, you know, you know, encouraging people to go out and vote, um, you know, making them believe that yes, this time when you vote against Jame, he will go out because you will know the result even before the Electoral Institute actually knows, knows, knows the result. So people went out and vote, and then uh, with, those, with those voting, um, you know, he was voted out. To our surprise, he accepted the election results. When he accepted the election results, um, he, he, after one week, he came out and said that, you know, I'm joking, I don't, I don't accept the results, you know, uh, there's a fraud in the election. Then we said, you know, we need to be out and defend our votes, you know. So that's where we come with, from the, 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 the uh, organizing tools, uh, social media was effectively used by uh, the WhatsApp, the Facebooks, and then others. We have effectively used in mobilizing and sensitizing and educating the citizenry. So we turned this hashtag Gambia decides. So hashtag Gambia has decided that you know we have decided you know that Gambia have to go. We must defend our votes. So people came in numbers, rallying behind this hashtag, mobilizing all the people that we have been training for this for, for the past seven years that I've been working in this in those movement and galvanizing the efforts and the uh, support from different. Uh, groupings of women and opposition all coming together to say that our, our vote must be defended. So we went out on the streets, we went out on in all angles to defend our, our, our votes. The president installed military everywhere in the country with heavy guns, you know, um, threatening and even arresting some of the activists 
um, you know, some of the activities we are taking to where we call place of no return, where you enter, you never come back. I was taken there uh, for some hours, and I was, I was really, I was being called several times that I would be killed uh, in, in different instances. But you know, that time, I, like there was no fear. That was because I always see that I, we believe that you know the the, the 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 solution of our problem cannot be from anywhere, but it has to be ourselves. We have to die for our country. We have to deliver the new Gambia that we all anticipated for ourselves and, our, and, and for our, our children. So we continue to really engage into, uh, into ensuring that um, um, the, 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 the voters are defended. We started mobilizing thousands of Gambians wherever they are by distributing t-shirts, painting the streets, painting the walls with the information that Gambia have decided and our decision must be respected. So that continuous organizing and mobilization, you know, help us to uh, you know, have the support from the outside world uh, coming down to Gambia. So we used uh, re really in interesting tactics during the process of defending votes. We, we had uh, a very strong meeting with um, an intervention from a Pan-African organization called Africans that we are in our work, came into the Gambia, we organized with them, uh, people started organizing, say, what are the pillars of support? What are the pillars that are supporting Gambia to stay into power? Can we really challenge these pillars to either choose Gambia or choose Jammy? So we identify the police, the army, the, minister, the, the, the ministers, the, diplomat, the, the, the diplomats, wherever they are, you know, asking them to really see Gambia, not Gambia, but also asking, attacking their families, attacking their wives, their children, to really ask their parents to move their support, remove their support from Gambia. So from those engagements, we saw that the ministers, the ambassadors, yeah, the ambassadors really, you know, most of their support from Gambia, and then Gambia could not even do anything but buy, uh, have to dissolve uh, his parliament. So as uh, his cabinet and as well parliamentarians were resigning. I want to conclude by saying that we use critical uh, five critical points. One, believe in ourselves that we can do it as a country. Two, resilience, continuous resilience that yes, time will tell that we, um, you know, we can win the victory. We, we use patience you know, and as well consistent organizing as a tool in, in ensuring that we achieve what we want. Again, we, we, use, we create momentums for ourselves and use them effectively uh, using elections as a momentum. Again, we also use, you know, an agenda forming. You know, we kind of rally behind one agenda that Gambia have decided. Let's forget about brand names of different organizations and rally behind this agenda setting and the agenda that Gambia have decided and then we all decide what we respect. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lamine. That was fascinating. And it's just um, hearing a resounding theme of the importance of kind of using the law and the constitution against the dictators in this case. So emphasizing the rule of law, getting people out to vote, and then preparing for different types of mobilization and the creative tactics and the unifying slogan of Gambia has decided um, was very, very interesting in, in your case. So thank you, Lamin. And I will now turn the mic over to Joanna Varone. Joanna, over to you. Sure. Hello, everyone. I'll share. Let's see if I can share. Screen again. Okay. Can you see the slides? Sure. Yeah. So I'm talking to you uh, from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil under the government of Jair Bolsonaro, unfortunately. And my takes are going to be a little bit about how he got elected and the situation now. Um, since the elections were in 2018, since then we have seen hate speech, misinformation, data mining being used as tools for political marketing and for political violence, mostly against um, vulnerable communities, against women, black women, LGBT people, indigenous people, land defenders. Those tools uh, were started to were already present in the tactics of Bolsonaro elections, uh, and remain uh, being used now um, as to for him to, to be in power for government. And now we are going to go to municipal election for the municipalities, and we are observing that more closely. But one point that I want to make is that um, just as the name of, of 
the the meeting here, the event, we are all part of one and another. They are also part of one and another. I don't like to divide them and we, but there is a movement of the far right uh, of people that are attacking human rights, attacking social and environmental justice, uh, being with a um, comprehensive and collective discourse that we need to pay more attention to. So Bolsonaro, a, a few, like since COVID, uh, the pandemic started, he was saying, this is just a little flu. And then he got infected as well, because he does, doesn't wear masks. Can we see similarities in here? Uh, and the similarities of this course goes over and over. He already, during the, the pandemic, uh, his sons are being investigated uh, for, for corruption. So a few months ago, he was also saying that he's not gonna abide by orders of the Supreme Court. He has the forces of the military and he was threatening uh, a coup, military coup as well. And we were here all like, oh my God, what's the escaping plan if we need to? What's the fighting plan? You know? And that discourse passed. What we saw is that uh, he doesn't need to bring the army to the streets to instate a dictatorship, to instate an authoritarian regime, to uh, uh, start uh, threatening fundamental rights. Um, as we see now, the Amazon is on fire, our wetlands are on fire, and this uh, is because using the bureaucracy, he could dismantle all the environmental protections for those um, ecosystems. Um, so he, he talked flu, little flu, got infected, called the military support against democratical institutions. The discourse are connected and it's not by chance. This is Bolsonaro with Steve Bannon. This is his son with Steve Bannon and also Olavo de Carvalho, who is like the, the, the thinker that Bolsonaro follows. Those people are talking and those people are uh, seeing and, and sharing a strategy to game our media system, our media ecosystem uh, towards causing confusion, towards bringing this story, this narrative, uh, which is denialist, uh, for climate change, which attacks LGBT people, sexual and uh, reproductive rights. It feeds a lot in the incel narrative and the Keno narrative. And I don't want to sound uh, like conspiracy theories, but those the, we can see that those tactics are uh, happening while the more progressive field is still not very tuned with technologies and they they managed to gain the, those technologies during the Brazilian presidential elections but bolsonaro was no one to be able to like really fight for the presidency we were like no not possible uh, he was just a congressman but uh, he had help and he used those tactics he used whatsapp very wisely his campaign um, to spread misinformation and and whatsapp here works on zero rating so most part of the population have access to whatsapp and not the internet so they cannot even click on uh, that it's free for using whatsapp but if you cannot click and go to the internet so it's even easier to spread misinformation to to people who do not have money to pay. By then we were mapping how data was being used for the elections, for the campaigns, and um, a representative of Cambridge Analytica uh, in Brazil, we interviewed him before uh, the elections and he was already saying, and before the scandal as well, and he was already saying 
uh, that WhatsApp was going to be a huge tactics. Now we are going to have these elections, municipal elections 2020. Uh, we just released this guide for candidacies, progressive candidacies, to be more aware on how to how to engage in this new macro, uh, media ecosystem uh, in which um, our democracies are at risk. Also because the role of those big tech companies play on it. They have been gained uh, by the, the far right. They, they know how to earn money uh, from YouTube, they know how to mobilize and I, I think and I feel that the left is still uh, learning how to do that and we will never have the same tools because we want to play fair. So uh, the fight here, like looking at next elections is also in one hand uh, uh, spreading information on how, how can we build uh counter narratives how can we bring uh information valid information but also how can we regulate those platforms that operating under the surveillance capitalism logic uh ended up um rewarding disinformation rewarding hate because this kind of content is uh, rewarded by the algorithms of those platforms. So in one hand, we are fighting for legislation on data protection to be enforced, thinking about how to regulate those platforms on content management regarding disinformation, regarding uh, other kinds of political violence, hate speech, and so on. But another point that I feel that was crucial is that Bolsonaro, just as Trump, uh, they have this uh, character, this, yeah, this persona that is um, a persona that talks like a real ordinary person that poses not like a, a politician and and it's rude and and it at some level we connect of course all those uh, narratives and internet tactics were not just it uh, there is something that is capturing people's attention people that are fed of politics or people that are not going uh, voting in the US here it's mandatory to go voting um, so I feel that part of the left got disconnected to the base, to the grassroots movements, to the citizen, ordinary citizens that are not very tuned into politics. So for me, the strategies uh, need to um, reconnect, reconnect with people that uh, just quit. Many people voted for Bolsonaro because he was like a, a clown. And I think uh, Trump, that goes for Trump as well, in a way, the, the, the persona that they play, you know? Uh, so I, I think what's missing from the progressive field is to layer down the narratives, layer down the, the arguments for everyday life. That, the, the slide that I'm showing here is a platform that we are uh, building for denounces. Uh, on this election to create that, creating data, more data about those tactics and how hate, how misinformation is being used as a political, a way for political marketing and for political violence, particularly against minorities. So we are compiling a lot of data. We are trying to compile more data to, to uh, for the next steps. I'm thinking about the next presidential elections and the municipality elections now is like a, a laboratory for improving the ecosystem to avoid uh, to, to pass what happened in, in the previous elections. 
And of course, all these have a, a gender component, you know? We, Dilma Rousseff got impeached. She got impeached because she was, she was our first uh, woman president. And she got impeached because she was a woman in the end. We could not prove, they, they could not prove anything that she did wrong, just a woman that didn't do the, the right political alliances, so she got impeached. Then there was the, a vacuum uh, on the left, and Bolsonaro, with those alliances, international ones, managed to fill that vacuum, having those internet tactics, the, digital tactics, uh, having a narrative that ha is being tested worldwide from the far wide, and it's compelling enough with the uh, regular ordinary people that are not very tuned into politics. Uh, I think now the left needs to reconnect, reconnect with the grassroots, with the daily worker, the ordinary citizen, their needs, and then also understand this new media ecosystem and understand that our new challenges to channel narratives. Thank so I think that's it. No, that's great. Thank you so much, Joanna. Your emphasis on the importance of kind of a developing new narratives that really focus on people's everyday lives. Um, and also you raise uh, such good points about uh, countering disinformation and the manipulation of citizens via data mining and the like. So all really critical points. So our last speaker on the panel is uh, Stephen Zunis. So without further ado, I turn it over to Stephen. Stephen, you're on mute if you're speaking. Thank you, Maria. Uh, <clears throat> here in the United States, there's a very real risk that through various methods, the um, uh, Republicans could effectively try to steal the 2020 presidential election and that the Republican dominated courts would be willing to allow it to happen. Aware of this possibility, a growing number of organizations is organizing for large scale civil resistance uh, to defend American democracy in the face of possible efforts to thwart the democratic will after election day. And fortunately, there is precedent we can learn from. Uh, there have been three cases in recent decades, one in Southeast Asia, two in Eastern Europe, in which an incumbent president or party attempted to steal an election only to have it reversed through large-scale, nonviolent direct action. Uh, we've already heard about two of these, the Philippines in 1986 and Serbia in 2000. The third case is uh, Ukraine in 2004. And in, in looking at these uh, uprisings, the, the, um, the, the, the thing that these three uprisings have in common that I think those of us in the United States can learn from uh, are, the, uh, are the following. Um, uh, meticulous uh, election monitoring and uh, related, to, uh, which enabled the, um, um, the, the just disappear. Yep, your slide disappeared, Stephen. Strange. Okay, let's try it. Um, there you go. It's back. Okay. Um, <clears throat> It must just be something quirky with the slideshow view. So okay, we... but anyway, uh, meticulous election monitoring and related efforts which enabled the opposition to make a convincing case that there was indeed fraud and there had not been a full and accurate count of the vote. Second was mobilization within days that it became apparent that there were efforts underway to steal the election. Again, this was important to, to be Timely to, to be be quick uh, before the uh, uh, before the incumbent regime consolidates power. A third is large scale non cooperation, uh, challenging the legitimacy of the incumbent government, including popular contestation of public space, you know, like a main square in the Capitol or other areas of uh, strategic uh, importance. Um, 
Fourth, of course, is strict uh, nonviolent discipline by the opposition, even in the face of violent repression. And of course, this is critical for all sorts of, uh, of, of obvious um, uh, reasons, especially for regimes who want to uh, maintain the image of trying to uphold law and order. And finally, the uprising having support of both the centrist political grouping whose candidates had been robbed of victory, as well as grassroots elements of civil society uh, to their left. Uh, and so again, uh, while we um, here in the United States, we not, um, may not be ter terribly excited about Biden, the importance of, uh, of, of, of uh, defending uh, the uh, 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 democracy uh, again, uh, against uh, you know, Trump and all he represents is critical. But similarly, it, it's, it's important that, um, and that the uh, uh, mainstream opposition be willing to uh, accept and endorse uh, extra legal <laughs> efforts. And well, well, could Americans do that in this kind of sense? I mean, on one hand, we have a longer and stronger democratic tradition than most countries, as well as an impressive history of nonviolent resistance. But there are a number of ways that uh, mobilizing successful mass resistance could be more challenging than in the Filipino, Serbian, or Ukrainian cases. One is that the, um, um, in the Philippines, Serbia, and Ukraine, like most countries with presidential systems, the candidate who receives the majority of votes is the winner. With the US president selected by the Electoral College and with a number of other obscure uh, constitutional provisions that could come into effect in case of dispute uh, in terms of the seating of electors, it could make it so that uh, Trump could legally be declared the winner uh, despite losing the popular vote by a large um, margin. In that case, would somebody cautious like Biden and the Democratic establishment uh, be willing to endorse a massive extra legal campaign? You know, could a movement succeed if they were told essentially to give up? Um, now, if, if a major resistance campaign was launched anyway, would we be able to convince the establishment to join it? Um, and these, these are some of the questions that we need to think of. of. Another issue is that unlike uh, 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 th these countries, you have tens of millions of uh, Trump supporters, very right wing, who have guns. <laughs> I mean, not just guns, but semi-automatic weapons that they, in most states are legally allowed to carry around and threaten people with. And even if we were to um, assume that most regular police and military would not shoot into um, crowds of peaceful demonstrators, uh, you can't, uh, it, 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 it's less, um, uh, you know, likely that uh, these uh, right-wing militia, you know, could have uh, would uh, ha have such hesitation. Um, another thing, uh, is, but one area where where direct action could start uh, before you know, the um, election is in terms of uh, in-person voting. Uh, Trump has called for armed supporters patrol polling stations and heavily Democratic precincts. Um, and, and so uh, voters who may be intimidated, especially minority voters, um, faced with all these white guys with guns, which could be a little triggering as you might imagine, uh, it would be good if, if, uh, if movement activists could, could engage in unarmed accompaniment of the voters um, and you know, to, the, to the actual polling stations. Um, and we, there needs to be plans for specific kinds of mobilizations, including blocking and occupying key governmental, commercial, uh, transport, and other facilities. Um, you know, such mass actions are important as they uh, galvanize the opposition, encourage uh, participation, uh, prevent business as usual in critical urban centers, and provide excellent footage um, uh, for sympathetic news coverage. At the same time, seizure of a particular physical space should not be overemphasized. I mean, for example, in the Philippine case, pro-democracy protesters do not need to seize uh, um, the presidential palace. They just made it so that the presidential palace was essentially the only part of the Philippines Marcos controlled. You know, so while physically occupying a government building or an important geographical center can have some symbolic advantages, what is important is defending the constitutional system, not a particular building or public square. And the defense of society under threat of a de facto coup relies on widespread mobilization, of building alliances, nonviolent discipline, 
and a refusal to recognize illegitimate authority. Again, that, 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 that is the key then, in, as opposed to you know, occupying any physical space. And again, I, I want to you know, emphasize the importance of nonviolent discipline. I mean, that's critical to success of anything, uh, any, any movement like this. And, and um, when you look at US history, that the, the most dramatic um, uh, nonviolent campaigns that we, we think of, that civil rights movement, the anti-nuclear power movement, things like that, that they all stress a training, nonviolence training beforehand. You know, and, and uh, we're starting to see this training workshops, which is those offered by Choose Democracy, are uh, remotely, given the, uh, the, given the circumstances of the pandemic, have been ongoing. And they're critically important in better enabling uh, participants to maintain a nonviolent meaner, demeanor in the face of pro provocations. In addition, the threat from agent provocateur and hot-headed Trump activists require training and deployment of marshals as well to enforce uh, nonviolent discipline. Well, great. Sorry, I didn't want to cut you, cut off your thought there, Stephen. Um, thank you so much for those points and kind of just um, distilling some of the really key findings from research on on anti coup resistance. Um, we're about we're um, gearing up to have a question and area uh, question and answer period with the audience. So I would encourage everyone to start thinking about the questions or comments they would like to to make um, and maybe start putting them um, into the chat room. Um, but I first just wanted to have a little bit of discussion amongst the panelists um, who raised such uh, really important um, issues in their remarks. And I think the whole idea of kind of um, changing mindsets from kind of voting and normal political participation to mass non-cooperation is not something that Americans especially are necessarily very familiar with. And I would just be curious to hear, you know, from the panelists what they think about how, um, you know, how to address that mind, that, that necessary mindset shift. While at the same time, and for me, this is a key challenge with our system and the way that the voting is going to happen, we know that the results of the election are likely not going to be known on election day, November 3rd. So on the one hand, there is a need for calm and peace and, you know, um, patience while the mail-in and kind of absentee ball ballots are being counted. So how do you balance the need for strategic patience, if you will, after November 3rd, with the potential need to mobilize against any number of shenanigans um, that that may you know occur um, in an attempt to kind of steal the vote? So, um, you know, just curious if if any of the panelists have um, specific thoughts on on either of those points, kind of non cooperation mindset and balancing patience with mobil need for mobilization. Yeah, I can give it a shot. Go ahead, Lamine. Yeah, um, one thing that um, that it should be very clear is that we we it's a whole process that has to be followed. That's that's from the beginning, from the start. As 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 a voter or as as a citizen of America who wants to change, what does the change happen? You need to have the belief that you know it's not just about voting, but it's about preparing myself to follow my votes to the end of. Um, announcement of the results. So in, in any way that can be done, in any strategy that can be done, because the, the systems that we, that we use in Africa and what you use there could be different. You have an electricity system, but there are definitely, um, you know, technology, technology experts that can help, you know, create a system of observation of votes where, you know, where people can follow their votes through these electronic systems. So it's critical for that for that massive education of the population around ensuring that the whole America, or the whole citizenry actually follows uh, the votes to the end. With patience, uh, with observing non-violence actions in all aspects of the mobilization. So, but there is a need for that critical mass mobilization to do, uh, you know, a spot observation of the votes to the end. If that is done, the, the, the leadership in itself will be threatened. To steal. Can I can I uh, say, can I second something uh, Lamine said? You know, I, you know, I think 
you know, when I came to the United States, I was surprised, you know, watching the turnout rates every election, you know, we're very happy here when we get about 50, 60. Here in San Francisco, you know, we're so happy when we get 70%. You know, in the Philippines, it's about 95% turnout rate. People are not happy. Uh, actually, you know, 98%. They're not happy with the 95%. People, people go to the province they were born to vote. They travel far distances. That's how important the vote is, you know, in struggling democracies. Uh, and even up to now, you know, so, you know, we're, we're, so, we're so cozy, complacent. We say, well, no, our vote doesn't count anyway. You know, you know in those countries, it's the popular vote. So, uh, you know, so it, it's important to educate people of how important that vote is. Then you get interested in watching the actual process. This is beginning to sound like the Philippines where, you know, voting is uh, drags on for days, right? We're there. But, you know, we are there physically at the polling place, day and night, 24 hours. That's how valuable the vote is. You know, uh, you know we, we take shifts, we're there, we take, you know, we're off from work. That, that's how critical, uh, you, know, it, 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 you know, it is, the turnout. If the other persons have polling, you know, poll watchers, we have to have poll watchers too, you know, that, 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 that's there. So, you know, those are just my thoughts, uh, Maria, back to you. That's really great. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Gonzalez. And may maybe, oh, Joanna, did you have um, a thought on that question? Yeah, just to add on what Joaquin said, uh, I think there'll be a lot of disinformation, fake news being spread, Trump already uh, mentioned uh, in the in the debate that he found ball, uh, ballots. How, how do you say the where you vote? Uh, with his name in a trash. So I think those things are going to escalate as well. So to add um, what jo Joaquin was saying, people that are there monitoring should be also be like producing news about it and and producing information yeah that's a really great point joanna yeah, about and, 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 and Mayor, I, I may add just quick, uh, quickly i mean you, you you what you said is very important and, and patience is not a strong cultural attribute of americans as a whole um but uh i, I think um a, a couple of things one is in terms of 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 of, of, of Po uh, poll watch, you know, poll watchers and, and, and counting the ballots. The Democratic Party is very well mobilized on this score. Again, I'm, they're, they're, they're less well mobilized and what if, despite all that, the election is stolen. And I, I think one thing that between the gap of the time of the actual election and when there may be evidence that, that that's exactly what's going on, this would be a great time to mobilize people because there are a lot of folks saying, oh, I don't have time to think about after the election or or anything like that, because we just need to get out the vote. I want to work to make sure Biden wins by a big margin or, or whatever. But um, this is the time to recruit all those people from election mode into nonviolent resistance mode. And in th that's, that, that's where we can use that interim period effectively. If I can add one thing. So for instance, we had between the elections and the, the, the moment when she stepped down was 10 days. Uh, and uh, I think that, you know, it's very important to build uh, things slowly over time and to have a constant communication with people who are, as I said, the first, the first part is the documented, uh, documenting the, the irregularities. Uh, but this kind of uh, mobilizing is not like one night, like uh, storming the winter palace, like in, in Russia, but it's actually slowly building up. We had like people, uh, students uh, organizing in their universities, retired people organizing in their retirement homes, then taxi drivers, as I, as I said. And that patience is actually accompanied with building power because when people build power, they become more patient as they become aware of their own power. There is no erratic behavior. They know that they are in charge, they're in control, that the other side is losing. And then, you know, th things come down with, 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 with that realization. That's a great point. Wanna, uh, sorry, sorry, Maria, just, just quickly. I, and I don't want to see just, just red, you know? I want to see blue, I want to see red, I want to see green. That's us, that's America there, concerned about our election. You know, this is not about, you know, the Democrats need to be there. 
everybody needs to be there. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, that's really important. And, and just the point of um, this is not all about mass mobilization onto the streets and all of a sudden, you know, one day mass non-cooperation, the importance of kind of building power and bringing new groups. Um, and this is really where the organizing perspective comes together with the mobilizing perspective. And I would also note, because there are a number of really key peace building luminaries on this call, it's really going to call for a lot of dialogue and back and forth and coalition building and violence de-escalation, I think, during this period, which is which is going to be especially critical. So I'm, there have been a number of really great questions that have come in, so I'm going to um, start to address those now, if that's okay with folks. Um, so one of the, um, and this question has come up a lot with activist groups re uh, recently about the whole question of violence. And we've seen kind of a surge of um, militia, far-right vigilante activism um, in the U.S. Um, recently over the past few years, certainly within the last year. Um, and so the question is, how do you prepare people uh, to respond to armed right-wing uh, counter-protesters after the election? What kind of tactical shifts will be necessary? And I know there were kind of irregular groups in a number of the cases that you discussed. So I think um, would be interesting to hear kind of strategically, tactically, how do you deal with these um, far right vigilante groups? Who would like to take that one? Anyone? Uh, yeah. Well, let, let me try, you know, so as you saw in the images I showed, you know, the military can be very violent in the Philippines, security forces. But, uh, you know, we religious leaders had to step up, right? They're, you know, they had to pray. They were looked at as more neutral, more peaceful. Uh, the military wouldn't dare shoot, you know, some of these nuns and priests who were right there in front. You know, I don't know if the right-wing militia here, here would be, you know, amenable. They are also, you know, pretty much uh, aligned to many churches. Uh, you know, they're church-going people. So, uh, you know, the church, I guess, faith-based, uh, you know, groups have to organize and be up there, front and center. Uh, fathers and sisters, you know, you, you got to be out there to, to mitigate, to calm, you know, to... You so know, you know, because this is their work, you know, so just, uh, just so if I can add one thing, because I, we kind of had the like right wing militias. I mean, come on, I'm from the Balkans. So that's like, that's our specialty, you know, <laughs> we, <laughs> we started a world war <laughs> with those <laughs> ones. Uh, so, you know, this is the, this is the trick with right wing militias and Milosevic used them like pretty uh, effectively. So you send in, you need like two things you need. Uh, and both things are in the US now. You need a TV station that is going to interpret the violence and you need a small group of ruthless men, paramilitaries, not connected to any security force who is going to perpetrate violence. So they go in, they do something, and then the TV station interprets that. And it's a recipe for chaos. This is how war started in Yugoslavia. And Milosevic did it on us in 1996. This is where we learned the hard way. So he organized the counter demonstrations when we were protesting the, the stolen local elections. So he would send in his supporters. Most of them uh, like were very, very aggressive, very violent. They would come to Belgrade where we were protesting and they would start a fight. Some of them even brought guns and uh, you know, they, they shot people. But that wasn't the, the end of it. The end of it was that when he sends in the security forces like to kind of sort out the trouble and all that stuff. And that was just the excuse for that kind of crackdown. So we learned it the hard way that actually we need to kind of neutralize these uh, uh, right-wing uh, militias before they even engage with us. The two most important things is that we would kind of, uh, as, as I said, organize in the neighborhoods and in the cities where we had the, the, the support and it would be a defensive uh, organizing and we would try to prevent their uh, kind of movement into, into these areas. What it turned out, and I saw similar things in Portland uh, recently, is when they kind of stage that kind of intervention, it turns out there are not many of them. 
And without the support of these uh, TV stations that are going to interpret that violence, they actually don't have such a uh, uh, such power as they as they present themselves. So playing defense and playing like uh, again uh, in 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 the areas where 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 your support is is actually crucial to prevent that uh, development. And let me add that um, we've had experience in the United States with um, right wing death squads in terms and with people uh, and, and and voting rights, and that is in the American South. And uh, there was. Uh, um, enormous courage, uh, and people rose rose to the occasion despite the the very real threat, and people died, uh, and 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 that's something that uh, emotionally we need to be uh, prepared for the possibility. But also those martyrs uh, helped uh, help uh, <laughs> help build the movement. You know the classic uh, political jujitsu effect of, of violence uh, actually uh, making a movement stronger rather than weaker as it brings uh, more sympathy and support uh, to, to, to the cause. Yeah. I mean, did so you have I, a point on that? Yeah, I want to add two points. Um, one thing, uh, two points that will work very effectively and that work because uh, Yajame have, our, our dictator had what they called, he called junglers, you know, you know, they massacre people like, um, like nothing. And then uh, what, the, quick, the quick thing that, two things that work very effectively in Africa and uh, elsewhere in, very, in many places is the use of media, how to effectively use media to expose uh, these militia groups. Um, quickly um, taking photos of them, quickly exposing them on social media and creating a momentum around the bad things that they are doing. That's one thing, and then connecting this to mainstream media quickly. Uh, the other thing is we have to protect ourselves. The activists and citizenry have to protect themselves by, by coming in numbers as they move. So we need to kind of build friendship. We need to see ourselves as friends. They must see themselves as friends. When you're going out, you don't, if you're a strong activist and a strong organizer, you don't want to be adopted. You don't want to be kidnapped. You don't want to be killed in, 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 when you are alone. So you have to work in groups. You have to work in numbers. You have to arrange timings of, of action when you are moving out so that mass numbers will be quickly mobilized and then they, can, they cannot easily break the mass numbers. So we must have the numbers to be able to break them faster. Great, thanks so much, Lamine. Those are all really good points. And I, I would flag a couple more. Um, one is kind of the, on the importance and the role of women um, in these movements. There's been research that Erica Chenoweth um, has done that demonstrates that women's active participation um, in, in movements and kind of being in the front, um, kind of in the front lines has helped movements to maintain nonviolent discipline in the face of both kind of state and non-state repression. So I'll, I'll put a link to the, the research in the, in the chat box and also, uh, Nick Kristoff of the New York Times published a great piece on the role of humor in challenging both autocrats and kind of angry far right groups, how you can kind of poke their bubbles um, with the use of humor to counter the anger, the hostility, the violence. And so, you know, uh, Yvonne could tell stories all day long about how the uh, poor movement used humor um, in their movement, as could others. But I just flag kind of those two other points on, on kind of thinking about the addressing far right groups. So we had another really good question on this whole topic again of um, non-cooperation and um, how it can be framed, how acts of non-cooperation, if it becomes necessary, and of course we don't know this, of course we hope there's going to be a smooth election and it will, it will flow without the need for mobilization, but in the event that mass non-cooperation um, is necessary, how can it be framed as patriotic or, and constitutional? as opposed to being a general annoyance for a lot of people. So what, what do uh, folks think about that one? Yvonne, do you have thoughts on that one? I know from like how um, the coal miners and beyond began to engage in non-cooperation, how it kind of was used as, um, you know, this is the patriotic yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's so, a different context here, but I want to. Yeah, I want to. I want. I. I. I'll be like really brief because this can. This can kind of. <laughs> it can open up like a, a lot of a lot of uh, uh, in a lot of directions. But I think you know. First, you know, as I said, excited, getting people excited to vote and to defend their vote. 
So, so in an essence, you know, the, the, it's similar to what uh, Greta Thunberg said uh, when she started uh, like uh, boycotting the classes. Why should I go to school if, if like the climate uh, is going to, how shall I say, change so much that, that like the earth is going to be on fire? So you kind of pose that question. So, so the same thing is like, why should we cooperate as citizens with those who are actually uh, usurping the power? They don't want to play it. Uh, so in a sense, that was kind of the call. It wasn't like, oh, we're gonna do this, we're gonna, it's like, it's more like, hey, we're not, you're not gonna play uh, fair, then we don't wanna play. You know, I'm gonna stop my shop. I'm not gonna open my shop. I'm not gonna serve anybody because you know you guys are not playing i'm not gonna pay uh, taxes this month and all that stuff so it was kind of we are really angry at those who are who are manipulating the, the the process and as i said it started from like safe places the students first because it's easier for students to start a strike than coal miners then people in retirement homes like obviously that was only symbolic because they don't uh, uh, participate in the economy actively but they were on strike Taxi drivers, it was easier for them to go on strike because they, they were running their own business and also other small, small shop owners. And then it builds and builds and builds to the point where coal miners can join. That was risky. It was so risky that actually Milosevic wanted to uh, clamp down on the coal miners. He, you know, it's like a very sad story about that. The judge who was supposed to sign the order to clamp down on miners refused to do it and he was killed by the by the by the death squad and his body was 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 uh, thrown in the forest uh, mm -hmm. so so that was like a, a really a really uh, a tough uh, tough moment for everyone but it, it didn't come without without the the loss but it was built as i said over a longer period of 10 days where the easier ones were done on the first couple of days and then uh, it, it built up towards the more difficult and the more riskier ones. One, one thing is important, I think, the, on the one hand, the, the uh, percentage of Americans who are in uh, uh, organized trade unions is, is pitifully low. I mean, something like 10 to 12 percent, much lower than in, in most countries. Um, at the same, uh, and at the same time, you know, I think a general strike could indeed be possible. You know, given uh, the the interconnectedness uh, of the uh, of, of of the economy, especially in a high tech uh, era, a lot of people showing up in certain key sectors, you know, could really could bring the country to a halt. Also, and this is the true true actually in some of these other cases. While you know the, these uh, authoritarians had crony capitalists on their sides, and and those who might have and those who benefited from their policies, their 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 behavior was so reckless. Uh, that uh, and 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 uh, uh, and um, unpredictable. You know, the main thing that uh, that the uh, uh, capitalist class want is is stability, and and predictability. And uh, if, if there is enough disruption, you know, going on uh, in the attempt of a, a stolen election uh, right here, there are a lot of powerful executives, particularly those in the high tech industry, which are increasingly uh, in, in important and don't seem to be as right wing as those say in extractive. Uh, 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 industries, aerospace industries, or whatever, I and mean, folks like that, they could really, um, they could realize that hey, we need to join the strike to get rid of Trump, and get things uh, back to some semblance of, of, of normal. So, I think um, it's just, it would not just be a, a matter of individuals staying home, but we could actually bring uh, some uh, key actors, uh, se sectors of the ruling class, on our side. Can, can I yeah. say something to you know, Patriot? You know, Maria, you said patriotism. Patriotism, patriotism, especially on the people of on the street, is simply love of country. And and uh, you know, my my good friend uh, Stephen just uh, harped on capitalism, right? We love of country here is so attached to materialism and capitalism. You know, do you still love this country even though you have nothing? You know, that's the question you gotta ask. <laughs> And that develops your patriotism. That's the core of your patriotism. Not because, you know, ah, you know, I came to this country, I have a car, I have a house, you know. And then you are distracted from real patriotism, the love of country. It's the love of your car and all these material things that you have. That's why you love this country. 
you know, you should love this country even though you, e even if you have nothing. Yeah, I want to add what one, one or two points here. Um, I think two critical um, players are needed to be mobilized as much uh, in this in this process. It's about it's about them and also it's about their future and their children's future. One is women. You know, women need to be a strong force of mobilization uh, if they really want to win. It has been proven. It has been tested. Proven any successful revolution. Uh, the consistency of those revolutions are women in the forefront. And then they can use effectively traditional tools. What could be one, what could be two or three traditional tools that can be used to unify the citizenry of America need to be found out, need to be uh, used effectively to, you know, to bring everybody together in, you know, in a unified force to put pressure. Uh, that's, one, that's one critical thing I've seen work well in different places. I've talked about the Kalama revolution, that led by women in Gambia, the Broome Revolution, led by women in Gambia, and many other places uh, in uh, in Africa. The other point is, and then also, women is about them and their their, their the children's future. You know, you know, giving giving birth to uh, you know somebody, you know, have a lot of connection to the person. So you wanted you want to see some a greater future for this person. So they can go extra miles. There are many um, historical issues. So this connection of why women can go extra miles than, than men. So mobilizing them, having their support will, will bring a win faster. The other point is the, is, is the young people, the youths, you know, educating them, making them believe that America is about them. You know, the old people will obviously they have more time to stay. So they have to really protect the integrity and, and, and Americanness. So, so mobilizing them and educating, changing the mindset to will maintain the momentum will kind of create um, a lot of humor in it. I wanted to say that to end it with, uh, with this point, activism in itself, is, is, it has to be fun. So young people have, can bring fun in it, you know, using different arts, whatever they, they can use. So they can quickly mobilize by using music or arts that they, that, 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 that they use effectively. Uh, somebody can use sports, somebody can use music, somebody can use film theater, whatever, to mobilize the masses. And the young people are very good at this. So that's why they're critical uh, uh, to be used effectively. Not to mobilize effectively. Great, thanks, Lamine. There was a there was a great question about kind of how to get the traditional the party. Um, in this case, it would be the Democratic Party to not acquiesce to a stolen election. I think it, it would help to hear from Stephen a little bit his final point about the importance of kind of traditional party actors coming together with the grassroots and that being a really powerful combination. Any thoughts on how that came about and what might be relevant for American activists? Well, I mean, the, the old adage of the uh, people lead, the leaders will follow, uh, I think is apropos here. Uh, and it depends on, you know, uh, uh, you know, if indeed Trump tries to steal the election, how they steal it, you know, would they, for example, you know, not count or throw out large numbers of, of, um, of uh, mail-in uh, uh, ballots and have the federal courts uh, uphold that. And, you know, since again, you know, you know over two thirds of the federal judges have been voted are, are Republicans, and and yeah, I, and, and and so again, if it's legal, yeah, I, yeah, I could I could see you know, Biden perhaps um, acquiescing. But what if say um, there is massive pressure in, again uh, in places like California and New York, overwhelmingly Democratic states, to get their governors to uh, join the uh, the resistance? Uh, New York and California represent twenty five percent of the U.S. economy. You know, what if, if, if that kind of pressure, you know, shutting down um, uh, Wall Street, shutting down Silicon Valley, uh, massing people in Albany and Sacramento, you know, the state capitals to, to, to force their governors to act. You know, I could see, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, having a, um, even if there's reluctance, you know, initially uh, from the National Party, if a movement was, was big enough, you know, they and, and, and people, uh, this is clear that, uh, that they may have conceded the American people are not, it could get them to uh, reconsider. Great, thanks very much, uh, Stephen. There was a question earlier and I've been trying to capture all the really interesting and thoughtful questions that folks are, are um, offering. And one was having to do with uh, preparing for a long-term uh, struggle and a long-term participation. 
Um, and what can individuals do to care for themselves and to prepare for themselves kind of emotionally, mentally, um, so that they're able to kind of um, maintain a participation when the going gets tough, especially if the going gets tough for a long time uh, following the election. So thoughts on kind of self-care um, and, and its relevance to our current moment in the U.S.? I think, let me just come in first. I, um, critically, is, this is very important because we're going to break down along the way and you don't want to, you don't want to die before you finish the, 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 the achieve what, you, what you're fighting for. So um, building systems and strategies around how activist networks will be taking therapy um, sessions or, 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 you know, you know, bringing out your frustration to each other is critical. Uh, you know, when you are in, this, uh, in the midst of revolution or in the midst of pushing for change, uh, sometimes you, you forget about yourself completely. So, and then you go to certain emotional um, stages that you have to talk to people. So, so we need to build that system of, you know, um, being there for each other, talking to each other to create that, um, um, uh, that um, cycle therapy sessions for, 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 for each other. But again, you know, preparing the mindset is very critical that this is a long fight. You know, you cannot just uh, be, be, be have a belief and the mind that, oh, after the elections, we are going to be done. But you cannot prepare yourself that, you know, it's about building a system. It's about ensuring that, you know, we continue, we continue, we continue continuously engage until we see um, the effectiveness of the change. So that critical mindset building is, is, is could be the foundation of it. But again, uh, being there for each other is another, it's another, it's another step that needs to be um, um, uh, considered uh, in terms of, uh, you know, actually allowing people to vom vomit out, you know, vomiting it out, uh, the frustration that they're facing with so that they will not break down. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Lamine. And I really, I should have noted it's self-care and community care, as someone really aptly pointed out in, in the chat. And, you know, one thing that brings to mind is, um, you know, just the powerful proliferation of mutual aid networks and kind of self-organizing groups in the U.S. that emerged um, certainly before the pandemic, but really there's been this um, acceleration and, and deepening of mutual aid networks. And I often wonder what their you know, what role they could play, um, you know, during this election period and, and in the aftermath in the event that there's a contested election, because it seems like they're going to be key to kind of keeping communities uh, strong uh, and resilient in the aftermath. Any other thoughts from the panelists on kind of thinking about community resilience in a, in a context like this? Uh, Maria, yes. Uh, yes. Kind of a mix of the previous uh, point, uh, like bringing people to vote and community resilience. Um, I, now, now we have Trump and Biden, none of them are very appealing, like white men, white old men, and the world has gone so far on identity politics. So again, coming back to my, my point, we need to bring, uh, we are not fighting just those two men, we are fighting uh ideas and visions of the world how, how do we bring that to our daily lives to the daily lives of everyone so fostering community media that will be able to translate uh what those two options are to daily daily activities and challenges of, on life because Biden is not going to be able, he's very bad on debating and bringing his point, unfortunately, not very charismatic. And then we need more, more people to be involved. So community media fostering this ecosystem, it will also foster an uh, ecosystem of care. People will be producing media, caring about each other and having fun. I think having fun is also part of resilience and important for community care. So you can also like bring your voice, bring your points in a in community and do this uh, like local productions and maybe articulate in a network. Uh, there is uh, the U.S. is very rich in community media 
network, no? There was a light media conference, it's so vivid and so people so inspiring uh, to produce things with humor, with fun, but very politicized. So I think fostering and connecting those networks will be important, not only to bring people to vote, but also to bring people to uh, keep an eye on the counting and of caring each other. Uh, Great. Thanks, can, can I get, yeah, can I add something, Maria? You know, I think uh, for mental mental health, uh, sanity, and community care, you know, we you have to learn to attach and detach to the emotions of the situation. If the media, watching TV, right, looking at your social media, is really creating that much stress, you need to detach. I mean, people have to be, you know, to realize that if you're watching all the time, you're gonna get hyped up. You're gonna get drawn. You're gonna, you know, you, you're, you know, you're gonna be, uh, your, 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 your mental health is gonna suffer. So that that detaching is really very, very important. And what do you do during that detaching? It's just like, uh, you know, Joanna emphasized. You know, you gotta do something fun. You know, Lamine also emphasized this, right? I'm the president of the senior center here. Since COVID nineteen hit, it's so hard for me to, you know, give my seniors who are in, you know, cloistered in buildings something to do you know we are creatures of innovation when these things happen you know i had to mail out their bingo cards and play zoom bingo we do zoom karaoke these days you know so these are the, you know we sing we have fun we you know uh, anything to put uh, you know really bright lights and optimism uh, in people because uh, that's needed that's gonna be needed, you know. When it drags out, wow, it's gonna be very pessimi pessimistic and gloomy. Okay, thank you, jo uh, Joaquin. That was, those were great points. Um, there was a, earlier a, a couple of questions and interjections about how to activate celebrities, athletes, and then I'll link that to another question about how to get social media companies and Fortune 500 companies to essentially. Uh, commit publicly to ensuring that all votes are counted and that the results um, reflect the will of the people. So any uh, thoughts, and I would note from the athlete's perspective, one of the most powerful uh, tactics in recent weeks was the uh, boycott across professional sports following the killing of Jacob Blake, starting with the WNBA, then the NBA, and then Major League Baseball, soccer, like all the sports kind of got into the act as a sign of, um, you know, unified solidarity. And it was kind of a, a powerful action. And I've been thinking, is there going to, you know, might there be the need for a similar type of, of activity across kind of um, athletes and, and celebrities? In, in the in the aftermath of the election. So any thoughts from the group? And I know the business question is a is a different one. So if, if folks have thoughts on either one, kind of engaging social media business or or celebrities athletes. Well, one thing that, that that business and athletes and uh, 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 actors and other celebrities have in have in common is they really are concerned about what what people think and where other people are coming from. So I think first and foremost, we need to have a strong popular movement so they will recognize that they are um, uh, responding to uh, the, a pop the popular will. So yes, I'm all, all for reaching out where people have connections to do this, but uh, again, it's no su substitution for being able to show uh, tangible uh, resistance and support on the ground. Great, thanks, Stephen. Other thoughts from panelists? Yeah, I wanted to say that um, it's, it's, it's critical to create, to create, to ignite and create and reinforce the anger within certain groups that have been affected seriously by the regime. You know, um, if it is the uh, athletic community, the artist community, whatever community, they need to be reminded of the, of the brutality of the killings that they have suffered from. And then quickly can create an anger from that, from that group. But it's, it's very critical to use them effectively because they have the numbers, they can easily mobilize thousands of people or millions of people in, in one spot, uh, one with one tweet. So, so they're a great target, but how to use them effectively is to create an anger with, within them. You know, you remind, by reminding them of the atrocities that have happened that need to end now. And what can end it is for their actions to, be, to, to reinforce those things. So I think for me, that's this one thing that I've seen work very well, you know, creating that anger, you know, 
uh, the more people are angry about the, the, the challenges that they, are, that they are living with, the more uh, actions they will take together and the more they can, they can change, they can bring the change faster. If I can say one thing that kind of, to kind of build on what just Lamin just said, you know, I think we need to, we cannot look at, uh, so how should I say, let me put it this way. Every now and then, it's not happening very often, but we live in historic moments. And historic moments are different from our regular activism work. This is not just a campaign uh, that we're running. This is not just a kind of another set of actions that we're doing. Uh, uh, bad news about historic moments is that we are not in control of most of the things that are happening. The good news is that neither the others are in control. It's like a so complex thing. But what is important about these historic moments is that, you know, there is a chance in these, in these uh, terminus events for capacity to be built very, very quickly. And this anger that, that Lamin was talking about is accompanied by also other emotions that people have, the sense of civic duty, the sense of disappointment in where country is going, the sense of care for their people that they live with. These powerful emotions, most of them are positive, but some of them rightfully, uh, like anger, it, it kind of, uh, how should I say, it? Uh, they have a right to, do, to, to have it, but most of these emotions can be very usefully, can be very useful in building that capacity very quickly. For instance, I just, just to say like, yes, the labor uh, unions are very weak. Well, you know, in our case, labor unions were controlled by the government. So when we organized this strike, it didn't happen through the institutional uh, labor unions. It was emergent design that happened on the spot. And it is just important to use these emotions that people have in these historic events and to have a sense of direction and to kind of project that and to kind of transmit it to the wider uh, population, the sense of direction, what do we want to build? What do we want to, to create? Because then uh, this kind of emergent design will be more likely to happen and people will be uh, creating these structures and these institutions and, and this capacity uh, wherever they are. Great. That's a, that's a really good uh, point, Yvonne, about, uh, you know, there's a role for, for anger and frustration and there's a role for anger, you know, especially in this country now when 210,000, 210,000, uh, 100,000 of our uh, fellow Americans have, have died from, from a pandemic during this time. And so there's definitely the anger and frustration, but also the, the sense of civic duty, as you said, and the positive emotions that can be so incredibly powerful um, in this moment and kind of harnessing that. There was um, an earlier question, which I'll link, um, and this may be the last one we'll see um, before we kind of wrap things up. But there was a question about kind of how do you, um, how do you balance this need to prepare people for what, fall, what comes after the election and the potential need to mobilize um, and kind of prevent uh, something illegal and executive usurpation of power or whatever? How do you kind of balance that with the need to get people out to vote? You don't want to diminish the get out the vote message. And I think that's one thing we're hearing so strongly is that these things are not separate. It's about getting out the vote, winning decisively, kind of, you know, being able to monitor the votes and kind of declare when there's fraud or irregularities or whatever, and then being able to engage in mass mobilization. But it's not one or the other. They're connected. They're both necessary to kind of uphold our constitution and rule of law. But this is a legitimate concern that folks who are focusing on get out the vote and, you know, wanting to maximize participation in the election are asking, how do we talk about this and act in a way that's not going to diminish kind of all the unnecessary Necessary efforts to center on the election and get out the vote um, during this period. So any, any thoughts from the, the panelists on kind of how to speak about these in tandem um, as we go forward? What, what I would emphasize uh, would be just the, the fact that, um, you know, the higher the, the, the um, voter turnout, uh, which would uh, likely mean the higher the margin of victory by Biden, uh, the more, you know, cr uh, credible you know, the uh, citing of uh, election fraud would be if Trump tries to declare himself the winner uh, regardless. 
and, uh, and, and, and the less ambiguous the actual outcome would be. So it's, if for, in order for nonviolent resistance to be successful, there needs to be uh, a maximum uh, voter turnout. But also, you know, that the, um, it, but, it, but, but for people who are feeling hopeless, oh my God, it's gonna steal the election, you know, what's the use to communicate to them? <laughs> if, you, if you vote, you know, the ability of, of him getting away with that is, 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 is reduced. So again, I think they, they play, you know, you, uh, we really need to emphasize that, that both of those reinforce the other. Thanks very much, Stephen. Any other, I'm just trying to see if there are any other kind of major questions um, that, we, that we neglected to answer, but this has been a fascinating uh, conversation and so practical. Um, just checking here. Good. Oh, the one maybe to, to end on this, since social media disinformation is, is play, already playing such an, uh, an important and powerful role in influencing kind of opinions, how to use uh, social media for good and how to use kind of those who have a lot of influence um, to reinforce key messages and kind of challenge um, some of the inevitable disinformation that's coming down the pike. So maybe just um, a point or two on maximizing social media um, participation in the election and post-election period. Yeah, social media actually have been one of the main tools that we use effectively to, to inform and disinform and, and disregard the information, this information uh, that goes around. So, the, you know, a team of activists, groups, movements must be interested in really monitoring what is, what is really going on in, on social media and be able to really create quick reactions to clarify misinformation. Um, so there must be active agency of, of team players, underground citizens who are really, really are focused on that. So really um, discrediting all the misinformation. Again, using social media to pass, you know, uh, information, effective information, uh, effectively to, to the citizenry, um, using different channels where citizens are. I know the segmentation of where citizens are on social media is, must be very much clear now <laughs> by all Americans. So using those channels effectively to inform them, as uh, Evan talked about, you know, they, you know, bringing back the emotions of, 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 of emotional, emotional challenges that people are faced with um, in, in those, in those, um, on those different platforms will be an effective way of creating, you know, a, a unified anger against the regime for, 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 for a voter turnout. Um, you know, in order, to, in order to end the, the, the emotional anger and everything, we need to come around vote. Those kind of messaging will be very effective on social media um, uh, when, when we use it effectively. And then for social media use, it has to be consistent. It has to be consistent. Uh, we cannot be tired of or even taking a break. So it has to be consistent throughout before the elections and even after the elections. Uh, so th th that's, that's the effectiveness of how I have been using it and how it has got results for me uh, in different ways. Great, thank you so much. Yes, Joanna, please. Yes. So, uh, as I was saying before, so social media is not going to be a neutral battlefield. The far left, far right have, have played play the game, the system, uh, the algorithms as they work now, they push more content. There are violence, there are hate, there are misinformation because the, it, it uh, rewards uh, things that are more controversial. So if, if we just try to do it organically, the, the other visions will, are already spreading much more. Fake news spreads much more. There are many studies saying that fake news spreads more, much more than after the fact is checked and the, 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 the other uh, news or information. So to gain that, we want we need to put uh, pressure on those big companies. They are rewarding this kind of content. So we need we need to put pressure on Facebook, WhatsApp, uh, Instagram to take down content. And and on the other hand, try to build those narratives and uh, bring them in. In, in coalitions, in community as well, to have like to try to gain the, the algorithms as well. But it's yeah, it's um, 
hard scenario, like YouTube now uh, tends to give more visibility to far right videos as well. So th this ecosystem is gained and it's gonna be, the change will be over time through regulation, through fostering competition with other kinds of companies. Uh, but for now, there will, we'll need to have people pressuring those companies to take down some contents on, in one hand and then articulate to bring um, information in, in like coalitions of media people. Great. Well, thanks so much, Joanna. And um, I'm not even going to, oh, Yvonne, did you have a point before we wrap? Oh, okay, got, gotcha. Um, I'm not even going to try to summarize all of the remarkable insights and points that were raised by our fellow uh, panelists, um, but I just wanted to pick up on something that uh, Christina or someone had added to the chat, um, this whole idea that Trump doesn't decide who wins the election, we do. And I think that's such an important message going into this kind of home stretch and in the post-election period that um, the American people have all the power necessary to both um, you know, ensure that all votes are counted, to get people to the polls, to ensure that all votes are counted, and to ensure um, that we have a peaceful democratic transition. And the only way um, our incumbent president will get away with stealing the election is if we allow it, essentially. And so I think I think um, we've heard from our amazing panelists today kind of insights, uh, strategic, tactical that they used um, as part of their movements and what the research suggests about how to organize in the face of kind of irregularities or attempted coup or ata golpe, whatever one wants to refer to it as. So I want to first uh, thank all of our uh, panelists and maybe we can give a quiet applause for them before we move to the closing. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for your amazing uh, patience and participation for this two hours. So I am now going to turn the mic over to Nadine for our final uh, comments and closing. Yes, thank you so much, Maria. And thank you so much for all of our presenters. Um, and uh, we are just really thrilled that you could spend time with us. Um, thank you, Yvonne, Joanna, Yakim, Lamin, Stephen, Maria for facilitating, and all of the interns and supporters and tech people, Wujin, Fonzi, Dene, Becca, Ray, everybody who helped make this possible. And we thank Nonviolence International for hosting OR Books and Blackout for helping get the word out. And of course, I work with Beautiful Trouble. You can see on the screen here how to reach all of us online. And we really look forward to working with you in the future. And I think the big things that I take away are that we must engage as we can on a full spectrum. We need to bring as many others with us in the United States right now, and we shouldn't stop. People power doesn't stop, and we shouldn't stop. So uh, here's to all of you. We're going to unmute for our last minute together, and everybody can say hello, goodbye, thank you in whatever language you want. Thank you for joining us from all over the world. And we really appreciate the time you spent together, and we'll see you in the stream. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Peace, everybody. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.